Tonight, we come together, whether in person or online, to acknowledge and celebrate 40 years of groundbreaking cardiothoracic advancements at the St. Vincent's Health Precinct in Sydney, made possible by unwavering support of our generous donors. Starting with the first successful heart transplant for Fiona Coote by Dr. Victor Cheng in 1984, the heart transplant program was launched only with the help of philanthropic dollars, as government funding for transplantations was non-existent at that time. As many of you know, St. Vincent's Hospital was established by the Sisters of Charity to care for the poor and vulnerable. Throughout this history, community support has been pivotal in enabling the vision of the sisters, our hospital leaders, and our clinicians. Tonight, we will focus on how we can continue this tradition in support of the long-term vision for the establishment of the St. Vincent's Heart Lung Centre of Excellence. Your contribution through generous donations and your advocacy has been vital to this success. Tonight, we will also share with you the next stage of development as we move towards realising our goal of a centre of excellence for heart lung. A further $15 million will be sought over the next five years to ensure support for our translational heart lung research programs. As you can see, medical research and technology continue to evolve at such a rapid pace we honour the commitment of all of our supporters like you, all who are helping St Vincent stay at the leading edge. Let's first of all ask some questions of uh, Professor Peter MacDonald and your transplant research. One of the uh, many transplant breakthroughs enabled by the philanthropy from good people like you at St Vincent's has involved using reanimated organs. What can you tell us about that? Okay. Um, well, let me first start by explaining how a person becomes a donor, yeah. a deceased donor. So the usual scenario is where someone has a catastrophic brain injury. It might be from a car accident, maybe a stroke. They survive to get to the hospital. They end up in the ICU. They're on a ventilator. Uh, and then over a period of hours, sometimes days, because of the progressive swelling of the brain inside the skull, all the brain tissue dies and that person is then dead legally and medically, and that's what we know as, as brain death. But their breathing is still being maintained with a ventilator, uh, and the heart is still beating. So when that person is declared dead, if the family agree to organ donation, then the, the, uh, the state or donation agency will be contacted. They'll contact the transplant programs like ourselves, We'll all travel to the, well, a retrieval team will travel to the donor hospital and then um, the heart will, the chest will be open, the heart will be arrested with a preservation solution, normally put in an ice bucket and then brought back here and then transplanted. Now, in about a third of cases now, um, the scenario is, is similar. There's usually a catastrophic brain injury, but there is still some residual brain function. So that person's not dead, but they have no prospect of a meaningful recovery. So under those circumstances, the intensivist will talk to the donor family and say, uh, look, there's no prospect of recovery. We would recommend withdrawal of life support, which means turning off the ventilator and allowing nature to take its course. And if the family agree to that, then there'll be a discussion about organ donation. And if they agree to that, then they'll, again, they will uh, notify the transplant programs. We will send a, a retrieval team and at an agreed time in the donor hospital, they'll turn off the life supports and there'll be a team assembled in, the, in, an, in an operating theater in the donor hospital and they just wait for the heart to stop. And then they wait another five minutes and make sure there's no spontaneous return of circulation. And it's only at that time that they declare death. Now, this has become an increasing pathway towards deceased organ donation. And up until 2014, it was a major source of kidneys, livers, and lungs. But the one organ that wasn't being retrieved was the heart. And the main concern was that when you turn off the life support, you're subjecting the heart to a massive heart attack. 
and it was thought that these hearts were just not recoverable. There were rare exceptions where the donor and recipient were in the same, op were in the same hospital, which is the exception rather than the rule, and they withdraw life support in, the, in one theatre and take the heart straight next door and transplant it. And that happened in a handful of cases. But most, the vast majority of, uh, of organ donors don't, are not in, your, in the transplant centre. So you have to send a team out to a remote centre where you send them interstate. Uh, you know, we've sent them to, New, to Darwin and Perth, 3,000 kilometres away, to bring back organs for transplantation. And um, uh, in, we worked out that we thought, like other people thought, that some of these hearts from these so-called DCD donors, donation after circulatory death, that some of these hearts would be recoverable. But when you look at one of these hearts, when you open up the, the chest, the heart's grossly distended and it just looks like it's never going to work again. So there had to be some way of demonstrating that these hearts are recoverable and the surgeon <coughs> then had to be confident that if they put it in that it was going to work. So we modelled this in the laboratory and this was a base... I've been, you know, working in the lab for, you know, 30 years now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but we were really focused on this area for about the last... Fi or for about a five-year period from about 2009 to 2014. And we worked out, and this was in a pig model, that we could recover hearts on a machine. This is a machine that we built... <coughs> Uh, it wasn't the organ care system, which is a much more sophisticated machine than, than the one we build in the lab, but it's based on the same principle. And we show that you, these, you could recover hearts on this machine, and you could tell by their performance on the machine whether they would work. And it was through a series of those experiments done at the Victor Chang that gave us the confidence to do this, to do it for the first time. So, and we did the first one in July 2014, and the first recipient was a woman, Michelle Gribulis, and I saw Michelle three days ago in the clinic for a, a, ch a standard checkup, and she's going very well. So, you know, she'll be she'll be celebrating 10 years following this transplant. <coughs> now, since then, we've now done 101 of these DCD transplants. They've added in the last few years. They've added. 25 to 30 percent of our transplant activity, and this this wouldn't be possible without the heart in a box technology. Um, you can't recover these hearts with cold storage, our traditional methods. Um, so yeah, it's it's really been exciting to uh, to be part of this. Um, and as you were saying before, we were the first unit in the world to do this recovery in a remote centre, bring it back and successfully transplant it. So following us, uh, the UK started a program in 2015 and then a number of centres in Europe and the US started in 2019. So there's now been well over a thousand of these transplants done worldwide and their outcomes so far look to be the same as with the traditional donors. Wow. And it so. all started here. In well, your the, lab. D, the DCD started here, yeah. yeah. It's extraordinary. I don't know how you don't cry every time you talk oh, about the stories of I'm patients. A, I got <laughs> a pretty... Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's Paul that's crying. I'm, I'm, why, I'm why, crying. Why isn't this heart working, you know? <laughs> but I, well, but I'd, I'd like to acknowledge Phil Spratt, who's in the room, and Phil was here at the very first heart transplant. <laughs> It was, I think, Peter Apthorpe, and that was in, about, I think it was February 2004, uh, 1984, so. It's, it's just extraordinary. I remember when, when, of course, we all knew about the first heart transplant, which, Fiona Coote, right? Well, it was actually Peter Apthorpe. He was, he was number one, Fiona, Fiona was number two. Right. Right, yeah. OK. Why did she get all the publicity? <laughs> <laughs> so she, she deserved that too. She, they're both great stories. Uh, but when you think about, we thought that was revolutionary and what you've just taken it to a whole new level, real sci-fi stuff, absolutely extraordinary. And I feel very trite going from stories like that to funnel web spiders, but we're going to go there. Because I wanted to ask you about the work you're doing in using the venom from funnel web spiders 
Well, just share with us what res that research has entailed and what that means for heart attack patients. Who would have thought? So we, we've been working with a, a very clever venom toxicologist, a guy, Glenn King, who's uh, based at the University of Queensland. And he uh, and his team extracted a protein from funnel-web spider venom. And they've shown that it can block what's called an acid-sensing ion channel. They were, they were working in, in brain cells originally and uh, show that you could uh, basically protect a, a mouse from having a stroke using this, um, uh, this protein. But um, the best analogy I can give to describe how this works is to if those of you that have watched The Lord of the Rings, uh, episode three, when Frodo gets bitten by this giant spider mm -hmm. and gets totally paralyzed and appears lifeless and is wrapped up in the, the spider web. And, but then his, his friend Sam sort of rescues him <laughs> and, uh, and eventually he actually recovers and gets back pretty well to normal. Um, and the message there, or the, the message there is that there's a lot of really nasty things in spider venoms, but there are also some things that keep you alive and protect you. And this is what this protein, this is, we call it HI1A, <coughs> hasn't got a name yet, but um, it, uh, we, we've shown that it can block, <coughs> uh, if, when, you, when, you're, when an organ is deprived of its blood flow, whether it's the brain or the heart, uh, the, um, you generate lactic acid. The lactic acid activates this acid-sensing ion channel and this protein blocks that process. And we know that activation of this channel activates a death signal pathway in the cell. It tells the cell, look, we can't survive, best to shut down and die. Uh, but this protein blocks it. We've been testing that in the lab and we can show that in our DCD model and in our other you know, cold preservation models, we can get quite dramatic improvements in recovery of hearts if we add this to our standard preservation solutions. But we think that um, there's a much bigger area here. We think this is something that could be put in an ample, given to ambulance officers or first responders, and if they come across, if they call out to someone who's having a heart attack or a stroke, they could administer this, get that person to the hospital, restore the blood flow, and um, you know, hopefully have a much smaller heart attack or stroke than they otherwise would. Wow, how far off would that be? Uh, well, we, uh, we had hoped to start a clinical trial in transplants this year. Um, we need to complete, we, we <clears throat> hopefully, we need to complete some experiments which we think we'll have done in the next month. Uh, so with, if they go the way we, the others have gone and we expect these to go, then we'll be ready to start a clinical trial in, at least in the second half of this year. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary. I do have to know though, did the inspiration for this come from watching Lord of the Rings? Or is you, do, you are very familiar with that scene. <laughs> yes. Well, it may, but well, as my sister-in-law who actually brought that analogy to mind when I was trying to explain how this thing Oh, that came later. Up. OK. And I thought, well, no, that's good. I like that, yeah. <laughs> good to know that came later. And I loved that, that uh, scene of you stepping in to help Dr Paul Jans there. It's like it's just like life, right? The nurse stepping mm -hmm. in to help. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peter, for explaining all of that incredible work that you're Absolutely. doing. <laughs> Dr Paul Jans, yeah. I'm glad you've got your mic back on because we're going to talk to you now. Um, because of your request, I'm not going to read your entire bio out. Everyone knows no, who you no. are, but I will just say, for those of you who don't, I'm just going to do one par, OK? Yeah. Dr Paul Jans is the Director of Cardiothoracic and Transplant Surgery at St Vincent's Hospital. He leads the Mechanical Circulatory Assist, Minimally Invasive and Robotic Surgical Programs. That kind of sums it up mm -hmm. very briefly. <laughs> yep. So. Dr Jans, you, as we said, you lead the cardiothoracic and transplant surgery across both the public and the private hospitals at St Vincent's. So over your time here, you've seen some very significant development of the entire heart-lung research program. Can you share with us some of the key research areas that are now underway? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And look, Pete has spoken about um, probably the most significant thing that's happened in transplantation, I reckon, in the last well, for a long time, and that's this DCD program, and it's and it's um, it's really on the background of this sort of research that that 
Peter pushes into the, into the clinic that we've been able to grow into the unit that we are. And, um, you know, we've had a 30% increase in transplants since this program. We, and just to put that in context, we did 124 transplants yes, last year, yesterday, last year. <laughs> um, um, and, that, that's, that, and in terms of heart transplants, we do more than Japan, we're, and we're consistently in the top sort of five, ten, in, in the, ten to five in the world. So we punch well above our weight. And it's nice, actually, you know, to see a lot of familiar p faces here, because the surgery is one thing, and you know, it really hasn't changed that much, to be honest, you just sew it in. But so many things, <laughs> this guy's changed a lot of things. <laughs> Anesthesia, intensive care, and Damien there, and the nursing staff, um, they're really the, the sort of the, the force behind a lot of the, the great things that happen at St Vincent's. Um, and we get the privilege of just, you know, like the winger scoring the try, um, getting all the accolades. But it really is a fantastic place to work. And um, credit goes to the sort of family that makes it all happen. But um, so from transplant point of view, we, you know, we, we do more than 50% we do over 50% of the transplants in Australia um, right here. So, um, and you know, as you know, I acknowledge Phil Spratt, you know, we, and, and, and also it's great to see Alan Farnsworth here. He's a surgeon that's been at St Vincent's forever and, and really, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. The, and, and I think the, the, the secret to a lot of the reasons why it's such a great place, he's such a fantastic surgeon and mentor. So it's, it's, it's hard not to, it's, they're hard shoes to fill. Um, but thankfully we've got a great team. Um, there's lots of other things, the minimally invasive surgical program. Well, there's two, two aspects to minimally invasive valve surgery. There's the, the surgery aspect of it, which you may have all heard of, which is the robotic stuff or, or doing open heart surgery through little keyholes, um, which we started, or Phil and I started back in the, whenever that was. Um, <laughs> And um, that was kind of fun. And, um, and but you know, that, that robot was bought with philanthropic money and we embarked on that program. And from that, the minimally invasive surgical program um, grew where we can do surgery through little keyholes. Um, the anesthesia developed, the intensive care got better. And, um, and now we're probably the biggest unit in, definitely in the state, if not in the country, in terms of minimally invasive surgery. And then, then the second part of minimally invasive valve surgery is, is the structural heart stuff, the, the stuff that the, the cardiologists do. And David Muller's in the, in the audience here, and he's led this program for... <laughs> he's led this program for a long time. Sorry, David. Uh, 15, 16 years, um, this structural heart program's been going, and that's where... Uh, you don't need an operation, you barely need an anaesthetic, and these guys just slip in through, through the artery in your groin and, and deploy a valve in your, um, and replace your aortic valve. And, um, and it's, do we do the first, I think, 2008? Yeah, 2008, the first was done here in St Vincent's through philanthropic money. No one believed it was possible. We still don't believe it's possible, but, um, and, um, and now it's now it's standard of care, and, and David and David Roy and Andrew Roy and um, those guys are, are doing six, ten a day. Um, yeah, yes, that's right. And then and and with the mitral valve, the other valves, the mitral and the tricuspid valve, they let me into the cath lab every now and again. And David and I can now treat leaking valves, both mitral and tricuspid, um, through through the catheters. So without having to have an operation. Um, they do get an anaesthetic, so Damien's still got a job. But me, I'm sadly. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone needs any gardening done. Um, and so, so that's been amazing, and that's, that's grown, and that's um, fantastic. Um, there's the mechanical circulatory assist program. So that's another big um, portfolio at St Vincent. So these are little artificial hearts or pumps we put in. So not everybody can get to a transplant. Um, in, the, in the day, what would it be, 20% would die on the waiting list? Or, mm. Yeah, so um, just waiting for a heart. And so now we can put a little pump in uh, and keep someone alive, in fact, make them better uh, and get them to a heart transplant. 
uh, and that's grown um, and it's very exciting. And that, that lab's headed up by Chris Hayward, um, Professor Hayward, um, to me. And, um, <laughs> and he, he's really got an international reputation. I think St Vincent's is, is very highly regarded internationally uh, in, that, in that space. Um, and this is going to be an exciting year because there's a, there's a couple of new pumps coming online and you've probably seen the press about the, the total artificial heart, the Biovacore, which we've been working with Daniel Timms, the inventor of that. Um, uh, and um, we've been doing trials in animals here and also in, in human trials. That's a, that's an, uh, in sort of fitting trials. And, and recently I was over in Texas doing the final sort of training and inserting one of those. So hopefully that's going to come this year. I don't know whether we'll beat the Yanks, but we're, we're right up there with them. Um, so uh, that's exciting. And then there's another exciting pump coming out of France, so um, which is going to be a real game changer. So, you know, and, and the reason we get to do that is because, you know, like people come to Professor Muller for the, the interventional or the structural heart stuff, they come to St Vincent's because of the reputation of the research and the labs that sit underneath all this clinical work. Um, and, you know, another exciting thing that has been developed is Andrew Jabor's work, um, mm -hmm. which is really amazing. He, uh, he's developed a way using an MRI to detect rejection. So, if someone has a heart transplant, I like to say we, but you, um, have to monitor them for rejection. Um, it's a sort of dark art that we don't understand, but, um, and that involves these days doing a little biopsy. So you've got to get a needle, you've got to go down, and you've got to take a sample of the heart and then look under, done, under the microscope. And you, you could do, have to do that up to 12 times in the first year. So it's quite, and that can in its, of itself damage the heart. So. Um, Andrew's developed a way with his team of being able to detect rejection um, with an MRI, so no needles, and, and that, that's really amazing. So, and that's being rolled out all around. So, so it's an exciting place to work. I'm lucky to be here. Wow, that is an understatement. That, there's so much, uh, as we say, extraordinary work going on in these walls and those walls over the road. And I'm sorry to make you talk about the boring part, hmm. which is the outside. Yep. Buildings, but it's important, isn't it? The infrastructure is important to be able to for this work to continue on. So I wanted to ask you about the. the I know the campus has undergone some capital redevelopments. Yeah, you're looking yeah. a bit stunned. Are you okay to talk about this? Yeah, yeah. Um, right <laughs> over the years, uh, th and that allows all this marvelous work to continue. Can you just update us on where that's at? Yeah, no, uh, a lot of things, and I, and I think all, all these things we've talking uh, we've, we've spoken about tonight couldn't have happened without the philanthropic money. And, and people like you in the audience. Dawn, there you go. I'm back. back. Um, it couldn't have happened without you know people like you in the audience. Um, I feel, I feel um, you know, trite sitting up here saying this all the time, but it is true. We wouldn't be able to do any of this, and Capital Works is even worse because we're the sort of kind of like the poor cousin in the in the Ministry of Health's. Um, portfolio, we don't get a lot of money from the government. So when we want to improve things, we're really dependent on the, on the philanthropic dollar. So um, people like uh, Michael Fenley uh, put together or envisaged the, the, um, the, the Cardiac Imaging Centre, ACIC, which um, I think was put together with $4 million from, from philanthropic money and then matched by the, the, the government. We shamed them into giving some money to that. Um, and uh, and that's you know that's busy as ever and, and going great guns and that's a credit to to Professor Michael Fenley who's also been here for a long time as well so and uh, you know <laughs> has, has has led us very well. Um, we currently we just got a brand new heart lung clinic. See the girls over there. They got new new offices and, and but we got eleven new consult suites for Peter. Um, and, and it's really nice because these patients, they've got it, once we do a transplant on them, um, be it heart or, or lung, we kind of own them for the rest they of their, keep their days. Back. Yeah, so um, <laughs> I remember Chris, Hay I was just thinking Chris Hayward told me the other day that when he started, there were 90, ni I'm going to say 90 post op heart right. transplant patients. Now there's like 900 or something, you know, that 
that um, I'd like to say we see all the time, but these guys have to see all the time and keep going. So it's, it's a huge going concern. And so we've just got a new heart-lung clinic. Um, we're currently building six, um, Richard mentioned that we're building six ICU um, beds, which we sorely need. Um, it's going in the little corner there next to our current ICU. We can't, we don't have any money to run them yet, but we're working on that. <laughs> um, but you know that'll that'll relieve a lot of a lot of pressure. And then we're we're also rebuilding the cath labs. And I think you mentioned the 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 project that's going on for the redevelopment of the interventional cath labs, which is you know the sort of you know beating heart, excuse the pun, of the of the place where a lot of this work goes on. So, Capital Works is important. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving us that big picture snapshot there, Dr. Paul Jantz. David Daly, Dr. David Daly, um, again, I'm not going to do a huge intro, uh, just that for those of you who don't know, Dr. David Daly is the acting medical head of the lung transplant unit and respiratory clinician at St. Vincent's Hospital. So, David, it'd be great to hear from you in relation to lung transplantation at St. Vincent's. I understand that, and I'm sure many people do, that whilst having a lung transplant, obviously transforms the lives of the patients who've been experiencing advanced lung diseases. The resulting quality of life and longevity of these patients, it still lags well behind that of heart transplant patients. So why is that? And, and how is the lung transplant research team at St Vincent's working to address that? Thanks Jacinta and welcome everyone tonight. So we've done 1,334 lung transplants over the last 40 years. So if you just think about the enormous impact that that has had for individuals living with advanced lung disease in New South Wales. Um, and that doesn't just happen. Um, so there's a whole team of people that Paul and Peter have alluded to that, um, as we say in our unit, keep the beast moving. Um, from our executive, our managers, our nurses, our allied health, our tissue typing lab. Um, there's so many people and, and uh, pieces of the, the pie that, that, that make this whole thing a success. Um, I just want to also acknowledge uh, Dr. Monique Malouf, who's in the audience tonight. <laughs> Monique's been working with the program since 1992, if I've got it right. And Monique has um, been an enormous inspiration uh, for all of us, wrote many of the seminal early uh, papers on uh, projection after transplant with, with Alan Glanville, and um, was one of the reasons uh, I have chosen to go into this specialty. So thank you, Monique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you're right. So outcomes after lung transplant are not where they could be. And one of the biggest problems we have with the lungs Unlike the liver or the heart or the kidneys, which are in closed spaces, the lung transplant is exposed to the external environment with every breath. So we run into more problems with infections that come from the environment. So our program really is, is working towards um, lungs for the future, is, is the, the kind of name for our research program. And we've got a couple of important themes one is early detection of problems with the transplant. So after the surgery is done, uh, the physicians look after our transplant patients. We see them in clinic and we do lung function testing to see if there's any problems with the function of the transplant. Uh, we do bronchoscopies where we use a fiber optic camera and we go deep inside the lungs and we wash the lungs out to look at some of the molecules and cells that are in the lungs. And we also take biopsies looking for rejection. So what we're doing now is we've instituted a program of biobanking where we're routinely taking a small amount of blood and fluid and tissue every time we do a procedure, um, in addition to the normal tests we're doing. And that's being stored in our biobanking facilities. And we have a whole team of um, database managers and postdoctoral scientists who are working to find um, biomarkers that can help us understand if there's a problem with the transplant, how we can get onto it early. And the, the second theme is understanding mechanisms of why a transplant might not be working. And we're really committed to working towards personalised medicine so that we can understand, you know, one shoe doesn't fit everyone. There are different things happening to different 
patients and we want to understand for a specific patient what specific pathways or molecules are switched on or off um, that we might be able to um, address. And then the, the, the third major theme is finding therapeutic targets. And, and, and by that I mean finding new um, targets for drugs that we can give patients um, so that they can uh, have less rejection episodes, less infections. Um, yeah, that, that's the basic summary. Mm. Once again, just mind-blowing. And every time one of you has spoken, you've referred to other colleagues in the room. So I know we've just got this extraordinary pool of talent at the hospital. And I wanted to ask you about that because having, of course, cutting-edge technology and top-notch facilities is important. However, investment in attracting and developing specialist talent is you know, really just as crucial. Can you tell us about that aspect of the research strategy, how you do that? I think one thing that's really special and unique about our heart-lung program is the intergenerational sharing of knowledge and training. If you look at Peter Mack, he's supervised so many PhD candidates in our program, um, including myself. I just submitted my PhD. So it's, um, there's, there's, there's a really special culture around training and sharing of knowledge. And, and what we're really looking for is to select the, the best candidates and the best scientists coming through so that we can train and mentor them um, into the roles where they can start to answer the pressing questions that, that are required. Mm. We are obviously doing that very well. And Liana Honeyset, of course, you are the clinical nurse consultant for both heart and lung transplantation at St Vincent's in Sydney. So let's talk about transplant nursing. So we know from what we've heard tonight, and many of you would already know, that transplant patients will at some point be waiting. They're in the wings to be matched with a suitable donor. I just found that fascinating, the way you describe that. What most of us probably don't appreciate is that one of the impacts of waiting is that the patient's condition will deteriorate over time. So one of the opportunities for improving quality of life for patients with advanced cardiac and respiratory disease are what you call prehab programs. Can you talk us through what leading centres around the world are doing in this space and the difference that it's making? particularly here at St Vincent's, of course. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jacinta. We're incredibly lucky here on campus. We've got a fantastic allied health and nursing team just to counteract um, the impressive power of our clinicians and physicians. Essentially, uh, St Vincent started looking at frailty led by the amazing work of Peter McDonald and Monique Malouf in this space, really trying to assess patients' overall health or their robustness, if you like. And um, over time, we've established frailty scores, which are now used internationally across other centres to identify how somebody's condition may deteriorate, specifically with uh, advanced lung or heart disease. Um, Peter's latest research has looked at if patients are enrolled in pulmonary or cardiac rehab, that it significantly reduces their frailty while on the wait list. And we know that that has huge impacts in terms of surviving through the transplant surgery, um, the length of stay in hospital, and, and nobody likes to be in hospital unnecessarily, um, and also on um, patients' mental health and their engagement in their families. So looking at this area of um, research is particularly important. We've been incredibly lucky over time with the amazing funding from donors that have allowed nurses such as myself um, to go to international conferences and really liaise with um, amazing world-leading centres. And I'm incredibly grateful to feel that we're equally received as part of um, that group or club here at St Vincent's to find out what they're doing both in the US at Cedars-Sinai and the Mayo Clinic and in Toronto where David's been previously and in the UK um, at the Royal Papworth and Royal Brompton um, and a lot of that is through um, clinicians, nurses and doctors such as myself setting their alarm clocks early to hit UK time or US time to work out what's going on at these other centres and what's giving um, their patients the best outcomes. 
So certainly we're looking at establishing our prehab programs uh, here at St Vincent's with this support of exec and it's not just isolated to transplant, it's certainly something that um, it should be stretched over other um, conditions such as if you've had a heart attack, if you're diagnosed with asthma and they're looking at in oncology patients at other international oncology centres as well and it's really a multidisciplinary approach. It's not just one clinician putting on an Olivia Newton-John video and saying go for it. It's that personalised or person-centred care as Dave referred to where we really want a tailored approach to exercise, to um, psychology and support to keep patients healthier and fitter for longer while they're waiting for a new heart or lungs, which we know will improve their outcomes post. Yeah, thank you for, for explaining all of that. And I think it's important also to understand, we were talking to David Daly about you know, the importance of training, retaining uh, staff and investing in higher training. I wanted to know how that applies to nurses to become specialist practitioners and uh, clinical trials coordinators. Can you share with us what form that can take and how then that benefits patients and their families if the nurses are trained in those specialty areas? Oh yeah, yeah, it, um, it definitely benefits um, patients and their family. For anybody that's been a patient here at St Vincent's and has had an amazing care of a nurse on um, a shift or multiple shifts, uh, you know it makes the difference for anyone that's been in hospital. Um, I guess with respect to that, we're incredibly lucky. Again, um, St Vincent's has excellent foundations with the Australian Catholic University where we offer postgraduate courses for nurses um, that go on above and beyond in their own time or rotate specifically through cardiac units. <coughs> the um, cath lab, which uh, Dr Jantz referred to before, they rotate through the cath lab, through our brand new heart lung clinic, through our surgical areas. And that makes them specialised cardiac nurses, which is fantastic if you're a patient that comes through our emergency department having a heart attack. Where it gets a little bit trickier always is trying to establish good pathways to keep nurses. We know that the mortgages around here are expensive, the parking's expensive, the traffic's really difficult. And um, so it's hard on a nurse's wage to keep coming into an institution that you love when you could be getting the same amount at um, closer in the suburbs as it were but we're incredibly grateful we've got an excellent team that we can work with with amazing support. I think um, outside of the uh, the post um, graduate studies which our campus allows us to facilitate here is also the amazing um, opportunities that we've had through donors where I mentioned earlier going to conferences both nationally and internationally to find out really what is the best practice um, and that collaboration with peers is, is really important. David talked a bit about research and certainly Peter's research um, in, in the surgical space, not to neglect Paul, but uh, nursing research is also equally as important because it targets what patients want. It targets some of the quality of life stuff, um, which we know can be fixed with a new heart, but um, it's all of the follow-up appointments, it's all of the biopsies, it's all of um, the education and research that's needed to go into ensuring patients do their spirometry so that we get better longevity with our um, post-lung transplant survival and um, having opportunities for nurses to improve their research knowledge by having um, scholarships for master's degrees or nurse practitioners also allows us um, to improve research capacity which helps us across campus. Thanks, Liana. And it, it might, I know you've been calling out your colleagues, it might be a good opportunity for me to call out Maria Reading, who I know is known to many of you here. Uh, Maria, of course, is very passionate and, and dedicated to cardiothoracic nursing at St Vincent's and is known to many of you. And she she's, deserves a round of applause. There's also Nicole, Natasha, and Jessica sitting down there at the front who are. Uh, sort of the driving engine of, the, of uh, cardi cardiology and, uh, and the heart transplant program. So. And there's, where's Jody and Kathy and... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We could be <laughs> here all night. We run our intensive yes. care unit and um, I can see Sam there who runs theatres. And um, I think that what sets St Vincent's apart uh, is is the nursing staff, no no question, and um, and it's it's 
it's this sort of can-do attitude that, you know, just let's make it happen, you know. Mm -hmm. When he comes up with some harebrained scheme, <laughs> everyone sort of <laughs> lolls in behind it. But, uh, you know, we're very grateful for the nursing staff we have here. Yeah. Very Look lovely. what I started. Mm. Uh, we are going to open two questions. We've got a few moments for that. So, oh, hands are leaping up everywhere. So we're going to bring you a mic when you have a question. If you could just let us know who you're directing it to. Yeah, to Dr. Jans, you mentioned no. something very funny about this French uh, valve. Can you expand on that? Uh, French pump, yeah, there's a, there's a pump. Um, so most, so most uh, left ventricular assist devices um, are just little spinning impellers or propellers inside a little casing and they're, they're very clever because they float inside a, a magnetic field and there's no touching parts and they suck blood out of the heart and then and whiz it out downstream. Um, and they've been very effective. In fact, they're, they're approaching sort of um, the survival results of transplants. So um, there's certainly a big push in this artificial organ area, uh, which has been going on for some time. There's a new pump that's come out or that's about to go into the clinic, which doesn't have a spinning thing. It has a little membrane um, and it's like a, a tail of a dolphin or of a, a fish, which just flaps up and down. And, um, and pushes the blood out that way. Um, and um, we, we've been involved, not so much with the development with it, but because of the, the pedigree of St Vincent's and Chris Hayward's work, we've, we've met, a, met a number of times. We've put one of them in in, in, in Europe in a animal studies. And so hopefully this year, you know, we might see a, a clinical trial in it. And it's, um, it's very, very impressive in what it can do. So, so yeah, we're excited about that. The sneaky French. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this is a bit left of field. I'm not sure who's best uh, or most interested in answering. Uh, but do you think it would be possible to do a brain transplant? Uh, Whose would you have? <laughs> has, it, has it been done on Lord of the Rings? It's not an anaesthetist. I was going to say, did, was there, uh, did you have any particular person in mind who needed <laughs> <laughs> Taylor Swift. There's a few political uh, leaders over there. <laughs> Who'd like to answer that? No, I better not. No. <laughs> uh, Phil always used to say I needed one. So. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to know too, would it ever be possible? I think it will be, um, but I don't want to be part of that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course you do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the the concept is that um, you take, you wear out the body, and you put the brain into a new body and um, start again. I mean, this is, I think this is part of the search for immortality. But I don't think that's necessarily a smart thing to do. Mm. Well, I know you were talking about Lord of the Rings before, inspiring. I know you didn't say it inspired, but that's the good story. Did, did, has anybody seen Poor Things? Mm. Okay, don't worry. It's about a brain, brain transplant. That's why I mentioned okay. it. So if we're using movies as inspiration, it's possible. Any other questions? So you get to choose the body. <laughs> We've got one here as well. idea come about? Um, it actually started with tarantulas um, <laughs> who have a, uh, they have a similar toxin in their, or peptide in their venom. And I, <clears throat> this is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure how the idea came about originally, but it's been around for over 20 years. And there's been study with this peptide in funnel web spider, uh, or in, sorry, tarantulas, it's called picrotoxin. And um, it, uh, it's been tested in mouse models of stroke and shown to reduce the damage that occurs if you administer this peptide. Um, and uh, <coughs> the peptide in the funnel web spider is like a duplicate of this from the tarantula and one of the postdocs working in Glenn's laboratory was looking at like you have libraries which have the structures of all these proteins and identified the duplicate structure within the within this funnel web spider library and 
they extracted it and found that it worked even more potently than the one in the tarantula at uh, blocking this particular channel, this acid-sensing acid iron channel. So all the original work was in, in stroke models and um, in their original paper, they published this in 2017, they administered the peptide eight hours after they'd induced a stroke in a mouse and they could demonstrate improved recovery in those in mice that have been subjected to this. Now you think, you know, I was taught in medical school that neurons die, start dying within five minutes of the blood supply being cut off. And here we're talking about eight hours and getting recovery of, of, of cells that were, we thought were gonna die. So the um, Glenn King, who um, basically heads up the group, he was a, a mentor and a supervisor for one of the, my research colleagues, Jamie Vandenberg at the Victor Chang. And Jamie told me about this work and I said, I want to try this in a heart. <laughs> and uh, and the, the rest sort of followed on from that. And again, it, um, one of the great things about working in a, in, a, in a large research institute like the Chang is that you, there's all this cross-pollination between labs that, you know, working on different areas, but, you know, you hear about something and, oh, wow, you know, I want to, you know, I want to try that. So that's, again, um, and then, you know, all my research is what I would regard as translational. I see the problems in the clinic and I go to the lab to try and work out how we might address that problem and how we might improve it. Um, as I've got older and I've become more frail, I've taken an interest in frailty. And we said, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, <clears throat> that's why we started looking at that as well. But, uh, but that's another story. Do you have a fun on where farm? And if not, is that an entrepreneurial opportunity? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I think it requires a brave person to to want to milk funnel web spiders, but um, no, we don't. And uh, but there is, you can produce it synthetically now. And in fact, there's a company that's been set up um, called Infensa Bioscience, uh, which is sort of named after the the funnel web spider. And um, uh, they've actually developed some very small mimics of the of the peptide itself. So instead of it, it's like an 80 residue peptide. The mimic is only 14 peptides and still seems to have all the potency. So that's probably the, the, the drug that will be developed for, for clinical use. So, um, and you don't need funnel webs to produce that. Thank you um, to the panel for a great discussion. Um, we've heard about um, the heart in the box and obviously that's more of a temporary solution while people are waiting for a heart and it's um, unbelievable. Um, with the, we talked about the media recently about the artificial heart. Is that um, seen as a more long-term solution where that will be a permanent um, you know, organ replacement or is it also um, you know, the, the current work that's being done, is that more of a um, temporary solution too? Thank you. Yeah, you, can, you know. Oh, look, I think, um, you know, the, uh, we'll never have enough donors to benefit people with advanced heart failure. So um, if, you, if you think of end-stage kidney disease, <clears throat> I think there's like 11,000 people on dialysis and they do maybe 1,000 kidney transplants a year. I'm not sure the, the numbers, but there's this enormous gap between the, the, you know, the people who benefit from, the, from a transplant and the availability of deceased organs. And that's it's going to be like, it's, and it's not going to change. So we need an alternative for people who, are, who aren't going to get to transplant. And people talk about what's called destination uh, VADs or destination mechanical support devices. So this is where you put a, a pump into a person and not knowing that they're not going to get a transplant. And, that, and that's going to be their definitive treatment. So the surgeon gets all the credit for putting it in and then the poor cardiologist has to deal with the patient afterwards, re rehabilitate them and handle all the... Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but uh, there's, a, there's now a, a, there's a slide I show in some talks which shows you the survival rate for people receiving destination LVADs, as they're called, and comparing that to the survival of people on dialysis, an age match group, and it's basically the same. So the technology now is advanced to where a point where, you know, 
VADs uh, w are just as effective as for heart failure as dialysis is for end-stage kidney disease. And even in those early years, the two to five years, the, the VAD results are sort of approaching the transplant results. I mean, it's a poor cousin because you've got a lead coming out of you going to a battery pack, but um, survival is very good, particularly with these third generation pumps, fourth generation pumps. And then they're soon to be completely implantable pumps. So there'll be a battery inside and then we'll be able to charge that battery th transcutaneously. So you'll have a pump in there that you know no one will even know about. And whether the total artificial heart will ever mimic that. The, the total artificial hearts we've used in the past have been clunky and old technology, but these newer ones are the similar sort of uh, spinning, spinning impellers which float in the magnetic field, so they show a lot of promise. Um, so, uh, you know, the, I'm not quite sure where, whether we're at Iron Man yet, but um, that's, the, that's the goal, I guess. Wow. And the things you talk about, you just think would never have even been in anyone's imagination, you know, 20 years ago. It's extraordinary. We've probably got time for maybe two questions. Oh, actually, I've got one on the screen. Let me just ask that because that's from, probably from someone who's remote. Let's share the love. Uh, what is something that is impossible to do today that you imagine will be possible 40 years from now? Good question. A hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I like that answer. A hole in one. <laughs> I think they were expecting something else. <laughs> well, we were just saying, and I just said then that what we thought, what is happening now, we would not have thought was possible 40 years ago. So, dare we go there? Well, I think we've covered brain transplants. Yes. I <laughs> don't know if I want to go back there, but I remember. A, a scene from some sci science fiction movie where someone was brought in uh, with florid acute leukaemia and put under this scanner, and the scanner just went over the body and made the diagnosis and then went back over it again and then had cured. <laughs> that's what I... And you'll all be out of a job. That's what we do. <laughs> I'd like that, yeah. This thing's falling off me. Uh, well, that's, that's all right, because we're nearly done. Oh, uh, Leanna, you're good at this. No, no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, no, it's all right. So let's ask, let's ha have a couple more questions up the back there. Uh, my name's Charles Curran. I know very many people in the room. And uh, yet again, I'm enormously impressed by the science and commitment of the people on the stage. But I'd just like to tell a very short story about the patients. Behind so many of these stories, there are patients whose lives have been transformed and families that have been transformed. And the story I tell is this. I was on a building site about seven or eight years ago, and uh, most people call me Charles, but uh, some people, some of the foremen were calling me Mr. Curran, and the, a young air conditioning contractor came up and said, your name's Mr. Curran? And I said, well, actually, Charles Curran. He said, are you involved in any way with St. Vincent's? And I said, I am. He said, I want to tell you something about our family and what a transforming thing happened. My wife, in her early 30s, contracted a lung disease and went to a major hospital, was told she was, going to, she was pregnant. There was one small child already. She was pregnant. She was told she was not going to be able to carry the child and that she only had a few months to live. Her only chance was to get on the lung transplant program at St. Vincent's. So Dustin brought his wife here. They got on the program, they kept her alive, they, the child survived, and Dustin said to me, rather than being a sole parent with a small child, I had my family restored to me, my wife, and we've got a second child now. So that's just one little story, and I'm, there are thousands of stories like that where these people, wonderful people at St Vincent's, have done such extraordinary things for families and for individuals. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for sharing that, Charles, and thank you for all the incredible work that you do and the Current Foundation does and saving lives every day. It must be very rewarding for you to know the legacy that you're leaving. That's only one of the stories that you heard as well. Many, many more where that came from. 
And we've heard, of course, about some of the extraordinary work taking place at St Vincent's in order to ensure that this cutting edge transplant research and the very best in patient treatment and care, I think that really came through tonight. And consistent with its mission of providing excellence in healthcare, particularly to the most vulnerable in the community. St Vincent's will continue to strive for better treatments and the best possible care. Thank you to the St Vincent's Curran Foundation team. And our enduring gratitude is reserved for our St Vincent's family of donors and supporters, many of you in the room here tonight. Your support for St Vincent's hospitals ensures their strength and capacity to care for our patients and protect the health of our community when it is needed the most.